The following session I wanted to include in this series, it's taught by a friend of mine named Steve Stutzman. We would do conferences and seminars together for about seven years. And I, I wanted to include this because I think it's the best teaching on the purpose of sexuality that I've ever heard. And I trust that it will bless you. Uh, what Steve is going to teach is what the world doesn't know and what Christian men, many Christian men, have never been taught. So I know that you're going to be inspired by this next session. God bless you. This whole, this whole deal about the, the sexual drive and the things that go on in a man's life something that obviously affects us a lot. Um, we think about it a lot more than what we probably want to realize. And, and uh, I have done a lot of work in my life trying to convince girls, single girls who are innocent, ignorant of life, about how conscious men are about sex. And I'm telling you, they don't get it. They just, they just stare at me. They just can't hardly believe that it's that big of a part of our life, but it definitely is. And I believe that the whole sexual thing is very, very important, and it's very precious to God. There are some very precious things about the whole sexual thing to God, <clears throat> and because it is so precious to God, it is in sex that God has committed the ability to create life. It's a very important part of his economy, and it's because of that, it also became a very high priority for something for Satan to twist and pervert. He wants to, the higher something is to God, the more Satan is interested in, in uh, tearing it up. I just, I'm going to talk a little bit about my life. I uh, grew up, you know, on a farm and spent a lot of time by myself and driving tractor and all that kind of thing. And was probably pretty cocky. I cocky guy about the whole thing of life and understanding life and all that kind of thing. Well, I got married and thought, you know, this is going to, uh, this is going to be a good thing. As soon as we get married, well, we won't have, I won't have any more sexual struggles. Everything will just be fine and I will be happy and um, didn't realize that actually there's probably more married men that have sexual addictions than there are single ones. Didn't understand that <clears throat> at that point in time. We got married and of course we had our ideals and everything. We decide we're going to take care of each other in every way there is and so we get into this whole sex thing and it was just awesome i mean we went at it we had every we just really got on this thing we were having sex three or four times a day it was just it's a wonder we got anything else done and of course eventually <clears throat> my wife gets pregnant and and we have a child and then a little while later you know she gets pregnant again we have another child and so on and so forth As this is going on we, and, and, uh, and, but she's pouring into me in every way that it's possible for a woman to pour into a man. She's given me herself all the sex I want, anything that I want all the time, telling me that I'm a wonderful guy, just pouring into me and pouring into me and pouring into me. And I remember the day that we were sitting on a couch together um, uh, talking about life and just kind of talking about what was going on in our lives, and she started crying. And she said, you know what? One of the most disappointing things to me is that I have poured into you in every way that it's possible for a woman to pour into a man, and you are just as empty as the day I started. Every woman kind of has this deep-seated secret fear that somehow in some way, she is going to be a disappointment and she's not going to be enough. And when she sees you look at another woman, when she sees you look at a magazine, when she sees any of that stuff, it feeds that fear inside of her. You are not enough. You are not good enough. And it's very, very, very damaging to them. Anyway... <clears throat> I began to see, as, as life went along there, and we're trying to deal with all this stuff, I began to see that a lot of the drivenness that I felt towards sexuality was actually not phys physical at all. There was something else driving it. I kept trying to find out what it was, and I was crying out to God and saying, God, what is this thing that drives me not only towards sex, but is constantly pulling me toward immorality? Even, even if I'm married to a wonderful woman that gives me everything that I want, <clears throat> I'm still constantly being pulled toward 
pictures or toward images or toward anything that has the form of a woman. And I'm trying to figure this out. And one day, <clears throat> we were in a, um, in a place where some people were addressing these kind of issues. And a guy walked up to me and just started talking to me. And he started asking questions. And of course, I didn't understand really what he was asking. I didn't understand what he was asking about questions about going from not free to to free not to. It didn't make sense to me what he was talking about, but he was just asking me questions about this bucket. And he was asking questions, different questions in my life about my wife putting into my bucket and how it was leaking out. I didn't understand what he was asking at the time, but what he was asking is, he was asking me questions, is your bucket full or empty? And finally, after a long conversation, he says to me, um, something went wrong in your life. Something went horribly wrong. And I was like, well, what do you mean? And he said, well, tell me about your life way back. Tell me what happened way back when you were little. And I didn't know what he was talking about again, but he said, well, did something happen to you way back when you were, when you were a little boy? And I said, well, yeah. I was six years old and we were driving through southern Mexico on the way back from a mission trip. Four o'clock in the morning, we ran into the back of a lumber truck and there's a horrible crash and the first thing that I remember is my little sister there with her head split open and my mom died in that accident and my, uh, one of my older brothers. And we buried him the next day and I was telling him this story and he's just kind of looking at me <laughs> and, and he said, well, did you deal with that? And I was like, oh yeah, I dealt with all that a long time ago. I got real angry with God. Then I repented of being angry and I let it all go. And now it's all gone. I don't have any problems. <laughs> but see, he had been asking me questions about the whole sexual thing. And he started to understand something that made no sense to me at all. And he said, just stay here a little bit. <clears throat> and he went across the room and came back with this lady older lady came over there. She didn't know who I was. I didn't know who she was. She had to ask me what my name was because we didn't know anything about each other at all. And, and she said, uh, he said to her, he told the woman, he said, this boy, this young man here does not know, it does not know what it feels like to be loved by a mother. And because he doesn't know what it feels like to be loved by a mother, he's struggling with all this sexual stuff. Well, I reassured him he was an idiot. <coughs> But he said, no, it's fine. It's just, you know, whatever. And I said, no, you guys are crazy. And he said, no, just sit still. Just, just you know, we're going to help you here. Don't, you don't have to do anything. Just, just sit still and look at me. So this woman gets in front of me, takes my hand and looks in my eyes. And she starts to say to me, I'm sorry that you don't know what it feels like to be loved by a mother. And I'm sorry that I was not there on your first day of school. And I'm sorry that there was nobody there to take your picture when you colored a picture in first grade and brought it home. And I'm sorry that you didn't feel safe. And I'm sorry that you didn't feel loved. And without even knowing my name, she was started going across my life and putting her finger on the most painful things in my life. I didn't even know what was happening. She's sitting there talking to me and something started to come up out of me and I yelled. I just right in the middle of a room full of people. And she stopped a little bit and she said, that would be a spirit. Do you want to keep it or lose it? And I'm like, well, whatever. <laughs> I suppose I want to lose it. So they start leading me in a prayer. We go through this prayer. I renounce this stuff, repent of it in the name of Jesus, whatever. They prayed over me. And I got up and walked out of there, and I was like, I don't know what that was. I didn't know. I was just like, whew. <clears throat> See, when I was growing up, I had always had this image of women in my mind that somehow or another they're mean and they're cruel because every woman that walked by, my heart was crying out to be loved and accepted by a woman. And I'm going to make a statement here that I want you to think about, and I'm not trying to be vulgar in this statement. It may come across that way a little bit at first, but if you think about it, you will understand what I'm trying to say. Every man on the face of the earth came out of a woman, and he spends the rest of his life trying to get back in. You see, for nine months, you were in there, 
and you were safe and you were loved and you were focused on and you were cared for and it felt good. And then you came out into the world and the separation began. And you got farther and farther and farther and farther and farther away from that woman. Even though she was still caring for you and doing your wash and whatever when you were 16 or 18. And finally your attention turns toward another woman. And you know what you're really trying to find? What you are really trying to find is that same warm, safe, loved feeling. I had been drawn by all this stuff all my life and didn't know what it was. But I couldn't get it from the women around me. It made me angry. And so I began to make sarcastic women jokes about, you know, all kind of things about women, all kind of sarcastic remarks and jokes about women that I had in my life because somehow or another I felt like they were cheating me. Every woman I, I met, I felt somehow or another like she was cheating me. Because to me, in a little boy's mind as I was growing up, she had the ability to make me feel warm and loved and she wouldn't give it to me. And so I began to hold it against them <clears throat> as I'm growing up. That night, after that event happened, that night we went to a hotel. And uh, we were traveling. So we went to this hotel and we stopped there and my uh, wife was not feeling well. She wanted some Tylenol or aspirin or something. So I walked down, went down the, the elevator and went down the street. And I went to this convenience store and I was looking for these little packages, you know, with NyQuil or whatever, nighttime Tylenol or whatever it was. I was trying to find these little packages. I found one, took it up to the counter, laid it down, pull out my wallet and I'm getting paying for this. And all of a sudden I realized that standing right beside me is a case of alcohol, cases of alcohol stacked on top of each other all the way to the ceiling. And, well, I, mean, I don't really feel anything toward alcohol. I look on the other side, and on the other side is a magazine rack from the floor all the way up to about this high, and it's full of magazines of nude women. And I glance over there, and I'm paying my money, and all of a sudden I'm like, wait a minute. I look over there again, and I realized I wasn't feeling anything. You see, all of my life, whenever I was in that kind of a position beside those kind of pictures, my hands would start to sweat and my pulse would start to go up. And I would start, you know, most of the time I didn't go and buy the magazines. Once in a while I would. Most of the times I wouldn't because I knew it was wicked. But boy, I wanted to. And my heart would start to pound and I was like, you know, Ooh. and all of a sudden I realized I'm standing right beside him. There's nothing there. There's no feeling there. I was wound up <laughs> because I began to realize there that the root of that thing had just been shattered out of my life and I didn't even realize it. I did not understand what was going on. I did not understand that when we are sitting here dealing with these kind of things, the desire for sex is actually coming out of the soul level. It's not so much something that's coming out of here or even the body. It's not a physical thing. Most of us think that the reason that we have so much sex drive is just because we are such stud muffins. Listen, we are a bunch of men, and in case you had not noticed, men are relationally retarded. And we don't get relationships very well, and because we don't understand relationships, we don't understand that most of our desires in life are actually emotional, not physical, including sexual. And our sexual desire is actually an emotional desire, not a physical one. And we keep trying to fill the physical part and it doesn't work. All we see is that there's an action. We have this action that we want. There's this action that we, the, this, this orgasm that we want. That's all we see. Not understanding that the desire for that action, the desire for that orgasm actually comes from the emotional realm. And what is going on in the emotional realm is actually coming from the spiritual realm. And so we don't understand that. We keep doing the action over and over and over again and again. It's like going to a... To a um, you're hungry. It's 11 o'clock and noon, whatever, and you go in there and you start... You, you've been working all day since 5 or 6 o'clock in the morning. You're hungry. So you go into a gas station and you plop down a dollar and they give you a hot dog. 
and you put some ketchup and mustard and relish on that thing, and your, your tummy is down there saying, send down a hot dog. So you send down that hot dog. And the hot dog gets down there, and the tummy is saying, that's about time, send down another hot dog. And so you send down another hot dog, and it says, that's, that's, we're getting somewhere now, send down another hot dog, right? Well, what ends up happening is if your esophagus, your tube going down to your stomach, goes out the side instead of going to your stomach, and your stomach is saying, send down a hot dog, and so you chomp that old thing down, it's running out in the ground. And the tummy's saying, that didn't work for me, send down another one. How many are you going to have to eat? See, all of a sudden, there's going to be a desire there that has no end, and you are going to be almost immediately a slave to that desire. To kill a lion, anyone? Because what ends up happening is you're going to be a slave to that desire because you can try and try and try and try and try to fill it, and when you get done, you're still going to be hungry. And that's what's happening to us emotionally. God intended for the whole sex thing to be three parts. He intended for it not only to be a connection between two bodies where there is an orgasm, but a connection between two souls where you are emotionally connected to that woman and the softness of her soul comes around yours and caresses you and makes you feel safe and loved. And not only that, but he intended for it to be a spiritual connection between two spirits where you feel her spirit and she feels yours. Now, if that does not happen, if all you're getting is just the physical thing and you're not getting the other two levels, then what happens is your spirit and your soul are down there saying, send down another hot dog. And so you do it again. And if it's masturbation or if it's pornography or whatever it is, you do it one time and what does your soul get out of it? Nothing. And so it says, send down another hot dog. And so you do it again, and what does your spirit get out of it? Nothing. And so it says, send down another hot dog. And you become an addict in a very short period of time. Because this stuff is being run by the emotional desires down inside of us that we don't even recognize. We used to have pigs at home. You know, we raised hogs. And the pigs are running around chewing on the gate. And they chewed on the hog barn. And they chewed on everything that they could chew on that was made out of wood. And I uh, finally went and told my dad, the pigs are eating everything out there, eating all the gates, and they're, eating all, they're eating, chewing on the steel ones, they're chewing on everything. And he said, oh, you've got to put salt in their feed. So the next time we ground feed, we hooked the tractor, the grinder, go grind the feed, he said, go get a 10-pound bag of salt and dump it in there. So just got a 10-pound bag of salt, ripped the top open, dumped it in the feed, mixed it in the feed, put it in the feeder, and the pigs stopped chewing the gate. It never occurred to the pigs once that they wanted salt. Now, I'm not trying to tell you that you're pigs. <laughs> but when that missing ingredient in them, that thing that they needed when it was given to them, all of a sudden, the appetite to chew on the board stopped. And we're a lot more like that than we want to believe. We have a drivenness. We don't know where it's coming from. We don't know what it is. But I would suggest to you today that the continual struggle that we have a lot of times with moral failure is not actually a physical problem at all. It is an emotional problem that has spiritual connections. And you will never have, in quotes, a victory over the physical part until you understand what your body and your soul and your spirit are actually seeking. As Bruce has been trying to say, the whole thing with the, with the sexuality is not a bad thing. Sex is not bad. I know there was one of the church fathers back there in the, uh, in the 300s, in the 4th century, that came up with this idea that sex is bad and that you should do it as seldom as possible, and I'm glad he wasn't my preacher. And he was wrong. Sex is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. It probably needs to happen more often. The fact of the matter is, that it's not actually the sex drive that is the problem. And a lot of times the reason that the women in our lives don't want to go along with our sexual drive is because they feel that thing not connecting. See, if you and I as, as men, if we are only connecting with the woman physically, then she is not feeling fulfilled emotionally. And she is not feeling connected with spiritually. 
And if she doesn't feel connected spiritually and she doesn't feel connected emotionally, she's not going to want to have sex. Because women are not as emotionally retarded as we are. <laughs> They're a little farther <laughs> advanced in some of that, so they kind of understand what's going on. So that's, I don't know, that's kind of what Bruce wanted me to bring out here a little bit as a, a bit of a rant and probably as an advertisement for his book. Because when we started looking at some of this stuff and some of the teaching that we were doing, we start looking at this thing and saying, if you're really going to deal with sexuality, you need to understand that sex is a good thing. It's part of the leadership that God gave you. But out of its place, it becomes horrible. It's kind of like fire. A fire in your house is an excellent servant, but it is a horrible master. And that's a little bit the way that sex is. If the fire is in your house, burning your house up, obviously that's a horrible master. But if it's your servant and it's heating your food, it's a good servant. So don't get angry at the sex or think that even the sex drive itself is bad. It's actually a good thing. The problem is that we have not understood what we are actually trying to get out of it. Well, we finally reached the end of the series. And uh, normally you'd expect me to come on and say, goodbye, your journey is over. But honestly, we know that your journey has just begun. You're on a major journey in your life. But I want to remind you of a verse that I quoted at the beginning of this series, and that was Romans 8, 37, that says that we're more than conquerors. And I told you that I didn't understand exactly what that meant when I first read that verse. But then God showed me what it meant. It meant that we are going to take the truth, truths that God gave us, and not just overcome, not just find the victory in our own lives, but we are going to take that victory and we're going to take it out and help other people to be set free in the same way that God set us free. And to me, that's the, the, just the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the truth that sets us free. It's not just for us, but we all get to be ministers of God in a hurting world. And I thank you so much for just sitting through this series. I trust that your life is changed. I also want to say that Ruthie and I are available for conferences on marriage, anything to do with leadership. Uh, we do, actually, we do a marriage seminar for leaders and people in ministry. The Overcoming Life, we do conflict resolution. You can find out more about what we do on my website, which is to killalion.com or brucelangeman.com. And again, thank you, and I'm going to pray for you in the name of Jesus. Lord, as each man uh, goes his way, Father, I just pray that your anointing will be on them to be more than conquerors, that the truths that set them free, the light bulbs that clicked on in their mind would not be just for them, but Father God, it will be a chain of influence that will affect tens, hundreds, thousands, and maybe even millions. And we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen.